So today our guest speaker is going to be Brigadier General H.G. Head, who's going to talk on U.S. attack, aviation, Air Force, and Navy light attack from 1916, 1916 to the present. Um, but before anything else? Okay, so. Well, I'm going to talk about my latest book. Um, I wrote this during COVID, and with uh, uh, some help, I got a lot of telephone interviews. There are 53 stories in the book, and I think it's kind of a, a, a primer for, for docents at a museum, because there are uh, lots of story, anecdotal stories I got from talking to Navy and Air Force pilots, and it was just uh, a lot of fun. Uh, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Air Force and Navy pilots are very different. They come from two completely different cultures. How many naval aviators do we have here? One, two, three, several. Okay, that's good. Air Force had difficulty with the attack. I'll talk about that in the 1930s. Naval attack on Midway, of course, is a famous story. Uh, Air Force rediscovered the attack in Vietnam using A-1 primarily, D-28. same engine as the F-8. Uh, the F-100 is a lot heavier, especially the D model, but we trained at Luke in C models. C models had no flaps. A's and C's had no flaps. 180 knots on final, plus two knots per thousand pounds of fuel. World's fastest tricycle. And uh, I was in uh, two deployments, one to Japan, Korea, and one to Turkey, pulling nuclear alert. Uh, that's what we were doing at the same time Navy was pulling lines on, uh, on carriers. I volunteered for Vietnam. When I got there in 1965, I was one of 17,000 uh, Americans in country. We had Vietnamese markings on the airplane. We flew with Vietnamese. We, we taught their pilots. The pilots that trained in the U.S. Um, came to uh, Vietnam. We found a dive bomb. And then on combat missions, we flew with uh, enlisted men who at least could speak the language if we were forced out. Now, why are Air Force and Navy pilots uh, culturally different? First of all, Air Force uh, squadrons are twice as big. 24 squadrons, uh, three squadrons in a wing, uh, 72 airplanes, uh, 30 or so pilots. The F-100 was just pilots. No, uh, no back seaters. Uh, fighter or attack, the Navy was 12. The big difference was we had a squadron of 30 pilots, one enlisted man, no maintenance. All of our maintenance was consolidated. The uh, strategic air command was taking over the air force, and they had consolidated maintenance for all their bombers, and so by golly, uh, the fighters were going to have uh, consolidated maintenance also. We had uh, 72 airplanes and 56 crew chiefs. Go figure. Not a very high-end commission rate. We weren't getting very much planned time, and that's why I volunteered for Vietnam. Every squadron in the Air Force maintained constant readiness, C-1. So you could only let two guys go on leave at a time, and the airplanes had to be kept in very good shape also. Now, several years ago, when it became apparent that the readiness accounts were not being fulfilled. None, no service could keep uh, squadrons at C-1, more than uh, just a very few. And so three years ago, the Air Force changed and adopted the Navy system of when squadrons returned from deployment, 
they go into essentially a C4 system, they re regenerate and they don't do much plant. And then as they get close to deployment, they have a four phase system and they do basic training, intermediate training, and advanced training, uh, red flag, other things. So it's very interesting to me to see uh, this evolution where the Navy system of uh, recycled uh, uh, red in. for a sea target. We do a lot of dive bombing, a lot of nuclear practice full level. Uh, never never planned on a sea target. And of course, Navy guys a lead and a sea target. But the big difference is this. I love this one on the left, 10,000 feet runway. We got two very, very good ideas from the Navy. In fact, I would say three. First of all, we got the fancy lights, left-hand side that gives you the approach slope indicator, two and a half degrees or so on the glide slope. The second one was putting tail hooks on airplanes. Uh, the F-100 had no tail hook, the F-16 does. And we re-equipped all Air Force airplanes, all fighters and attack airplanes, with tail hooks. They put a spring-loaded tail hook on the F-100, so this guy's land Vietnam actually had a tail hook. And the third really good idea is the approach and uh, barrier engagement, and that's what I caught in A1 uh, when I landed. It makes it a lot easier. A lot of pilots got killed when their airplane would land, turn over, catch fire. Um, so that was a great idea. It's pretty much beyond the imagination of any Air Force pilot for these two sight pictures. And uh, seeing a ship about uh, a mile out there, and about uh, half a quarter of a mile here, uh, rolling pitching deck, and look at this. This is calm sea and daylight. And doing that at night in a rolling pitching sea with thunderstorms, pretty much beyond our imagination. Well, I really hand it to, to Navy and Marine Corps pilots. So, here's a sequence that I've chosen not to tell the individual anecdotes, which are all in the book, but to kind of give you an overview of attack of airplanes. Everything started in about 1916. July 1st, 1916, the Battle of the Somme started. The uh, General Hugh Trinkert massed his airplanes. Okay. Uh, massed his airplanes to support the Army. And the Army needed it. They had 30,000 casualties the first hour and 60,000 the first day. And they made about two or three miles, which the Germans took back uh, the following day. Billy Mitchell did the same thing in 1818, the two big battles that the Americans had. He massed over 1,200 aircraft, uh, mostly in a ground support role and some escort. So everything could fly, even the uh, scouts and pursuit airplanes that just had machine guns, you know, rolled in. And uh, they learned some lessons from that, uh, which we all know. One is high loss rates, and secondly, the need for armor on uh, ground attack, because you're, you're so close to the enemy. Now here in the 1920s, uh, both the Navy and the Air Force faced cultural problems. The first combat action for the Navy and for any Navy in World War I was, first of all, the Japanese attacked the German uh, colony at Tientien. People don't realize that, that uh, Japan was going to get into the fight uh, very early. And a Navy scout airplane uh, saw the German part of the German fleet and immediately got the idea that airplanes can see a lot farther than from 50 feet up in the uh, uh, top uh, part of a battleship. And so uh, observation and scouting uh, was a, a mission that they saw. They did not see the need for bombs or guns uh, on an airplane and, and didn't see the need for mass airplanes. The big debate over aircraft carriers uh, between aircraft carriers and battleship, well, how, how many airplanes do you need? 
the Royal Air Force, Royal Flying Corps, solved the problem first. If you're going to attack another fleet, you need lots and lots of airplanes. So the one or two scout airplanes on cruisers and battleships would not be the answer. You had to have an aircraft carrier that could carry multiple dozens of, uh, of aircraft. Now the big part, uh, Navy had, Navy uh, junior people mostly who were flying aviators in the 20s. Uh, as far as scout, are they a part of the line? Is a separate strike force? And is it going to be war at sea or land attack? There was not much war at sea until uh, the big battle in uh, the North Sea, where the British more or less defeated the German battleships. Now, from day one, the Army Air Corps, Army Air Service, originating in the Signal Corps, had a debate. Uh, General Spatz said it uh, best. We. Others walked, the well, Army walked on the ground, and we flew through the air. It was as different as that, as simple as that. And so, uh, one of the very first laws passed in the 1920s was that you had to be an aviator to command aviators. And that was a big change over the Army because they had, you know, they, in the Signal Corps, uh, the ranking person, uh, had the, the, the authority. But there was serious debate about should the, the Army Air Corps and later the Army Air Forces in the 1940s, should they support the ground forces in interdiction or should they do strategic bombing? Uh, Trenchard initiated strategic bombing in World War I, but it wasn't very deep. You know, it was just beyond the edge of interdiction. Uh, but the Air Force saw that only the strategic mission would lead to a separate air force. And this is a story best told in Barry Smith's book, uh, The Air Force Plans for Peace. So, uh, and I'll get to 1935 when the big uh, change occurred. Uh, Dive bombing, 1925. The uh, squadron commander of VF-2 fighter, uh, flying the Curtis to invented, virtually invented, high angle dive bombing. 60, 65 degrees. They had been doing 30 or 45 degree bombing, but they found that 60 degrees was so much more accurate. And it is, I mean, just the law of physics. The steeper you get, the less the 12 or six o'clock error. You still can't handle, you have to handle wind, but steep dive bombing is uh, very, very accurate. And so from 1926 to 1945, uh, that was the best tactic involved. And they, he solved the problem and demonstrated in the end of fleet problem uh, of 1926. And that's another thing I'll hand to the Navy. The Air Force never had anything comparable to the fleet problem. We never went for big exercises until Red Flag was developed uh, in the late uh, 70s. We, we put together some exercises um, in the 1960s under McNamara, uh, but they were nothing comparable to a Red Flag or Blue Flag uh, that we did later. So here's what we see. Both the Navy and the Air Force started with the de Havilland DH-4. And most of the aircraft that the Air Corps flew in the 1920s were the de Havilland, and the Navy had the same. It was a twin engine, very big engine, uh, airplane, uh, and was used for reconnaissance, bombing, interdiction, strategic bombing, a uh, good solid uh, airplane uh, of its time. And of course, in the 1920s, USS Langley occurred, and you can tell your visitors, it was based right here at North Island, built on the East Coast, but sailed uh, through the Panama Canal, and came up and uh, was based at North Island for three or four years, had some very famous uh, exercises, fleet problems again, in the uh, 1920s. Here's a shot of the Martin T4, uh, M, M for Martin, 
uh, landing on the Saratoga, carrier number three. Here's another bark, see how bark kind of dominating the uh, Navy uh, acquisition in the 1920s. Until the late 1930s, when Douglas comes in and look, Douglas got with this AD Skyhawk. Uh, Douglas is really the premier uh, airplane builder and designer, Ed Heinemann. And uh, there's a lot about Ed Heinemann design uh, techniques uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the book because there are so many fascinating stories uh, that he uh, developed. And of course, uh, that was the hero of the Battle of Midway. In the 1960s, the Air Force and the Army were in a heavy debate about close air support, and I'll say a little more about that later. That resulted in the A-7 in the Air Force, the Navy, and then followed by the F-16, the Hornet, and the Super Hornet. Midway. Uh, Midway is a fascinating story. There were 29 ensigns on the Enterprise for the Battle of Midway. And there's a long story from uh, uh, Admiral Hopkins uh, when he retired to give a verbal interview on tape and it's now written up. You probably have it in the library, uh, but we tell a lot of that story. Uh, he took off, of course, you know, the Battle of Midway. Uh, he was uh, under one of the great uh, leaders of the attack squadron, uh, VB-6. The bombing six on the Enterprise. They flew out way past the point of no return. Finally, saw that one group of the two groups that saw the enemy fleet. They saw a destroyer hightailing it back for what they thought was a fleet. Found the fleet, uh, rolled in. Uh, he. Uh, it's a good shot of what his. We probably looked at. He's probably about a 70 degree dive there, but he gets attacked by a zero just before he drops his bomb. Base zero, dropped his bomb, and then hit for the water. He's flying by 50 feet over the water, back to the Enterprise. Another ensign joins up on the left wing, another one on the right wing. 40 miles out, one of the ensign's engines runs out of fuel, drops in the water. Left in noted his location. He was picked up. Within sight of the carrier, the other ensign's fuel ran out. He goes in the water. And when Height, when uh, Hopkins made it back to the carrier, he was one of five airplanes in the attack field that made it back. Amazing, amazing, amazing story. And here, of course, is the result. You can see the Japanese lost 320 airplanes. We lost 150. Nobody talks very much about those 150. Most of them ran out of gas. And so, of uh, these casualties, the Japanese lost 317. A lot of those were pilots who ran out of gas and were not picked up. Submarines picked up some, surface ship picked up others, but we lost quite a few. 1935. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's rotational. Yeah. Hold your hand up. I can't quite tell, so hold your hand up if it's not the you know, awful or close up. 1935, Boeing produced the B-17. This is the early version, tail gun, blisters like the uh, Catalina, with uh, guns in the side, uh, only a small gun in the And uh, remember, all the generals in the 1930s, they started out, most of them, started out as fighter pilots, converted to bomber pilots, and when they saw the bomber was going to be the reason to get a separate air force, they began to dominate the air force decision. The attack airplanes, and there are great pictures in the book, by the way, of the attack airplanes, the, the problem with aircraft in the 1930s for both the Air Force and Navy was that the engine development was not progressing as fast as the aircraft development was. And so you had fairly streamlined airplanes, some with fixed landing together and some not, but the engines weren't big enough to make them go very fast. 
they get to five or six hundred horsepower, and that was about it. It wasn't until the 1940s that the really big engines, and that's where you get the Corsair, the Hellcat, uh, all the aircraft that we think about in World War II. So I said the attack airplanes did not do very well in a bombing competition in Hawaii. And so the Air Force got the idea that if the major weapon for uh, attack airplanes was going to be bombs, why not use airplanes that are built to carry bombs, carry more? Uh, also, one thing, uh, somebody, the, the Air Corps Tactical School observer in the Hawaiian Islands exercise said, the pilots are not very accurate on strafing at such high speed. Right, 200 knots. Where were they wrong on that? As any jet pilot knows, uh, you can be very, very accurate in strafing and have nothing to do with speed, or very little to do with speed. So, uh, General Hap Arnold, who was the chief general in the Air Force, said, under present conditions, there is no such thing as attack aviation. And so we get the result of, come over here, they have a bombing competition, bomber Douglas A-20, the North American B-25, B-25, the B-26, and then later the A-26, which was both A and B versions, the, uh, the invader. So these airplanes dominated World War II. There were a few A-36s, the first version of the P-51 that was uh, being formed by Great Britain, and uh, the, uh, they served mainly in North Africa. They had good bombing, and, and steep, by the way, a very steep uh, dive bombing. There's a story about that in, in the book. Uh, slide. Okay, well, Air Force pilots, if they're fighter pilots, they were fighting or attack. No Air Force pilot except an A-10 would admit to being an attack pilot. Uh, but in the Navy, you know, right after pilot training, you get this diversion into fighter and, and attack until recently uh, that dominated the uh, Navy uh, cultural system. So I'm glad to see you've got a P-51 Mustang here. Here's a P-51, F-16, F-15, and we'll, those really dominate the effort for the next several years. And that's the slide that I just talked about. Now, in the 1960s, uh, General Maxwell Taylor, the uh, Chief Staff of the Army, became Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he launched an attack on the Air Force that, because during the Korean War, the uh, Army had maintained that the, that the Air Force never really gave good close air support. It wasn't timely, didn't have the right airplanes, didn't carry enough armament, and of course, they were flying the B-51s that had been given, they were given the attack roll from World War II. And of course, as a ground attack airplane, that's not the one you would choose. They lost a lot of airplanes who got hit, who got a bullet in the hydraulic and the uh, cooling system, and uh, would uh, engine would quit. So the Army said, we need better close air support. And if you don't give it to us, we're going to build our own our own little uh, attack force. And they followed that up, followed that threat with technology, and we're building the H-56 armed helicopter, a 200-knot rigid rotor helicopter. So the threat was real. And the uh, OSD, the Office of Secretary of Defense, had been trying to get the Air Force to buy the A-4, which actually would have been a darn good airplane uh, for Vietnam, as the Navy found out, and the Navy, you know, tremendous uh, expertise in the, in the uh, ground attack world. But the Air Force didn't want another Navy airplane. They just bought the F-4. And we were getting F-4 into the fleet, because the F-4 was fast, through uh, air, air, and air to ground. So we had a competition. The F-5 was like the squishy tiger airplane, sweetie. Uh, and with this bomb load, the radius of action was about 75 miles. 
And I don't think there, I don't think Vietnamese ever bought it. <laughs> because it became painfully obvious. It just didn't carry very much fuel. But the supersonic Air Force Airports wanted the F-5. And there are two studies, the F-5 came out on top. The first one was he said, wrong answer, go back and do it again. Yeah. And so they went to a much uh, more complicated. The A-7 had just flown. A-7 is going to replace the A-4. And uh, 1965 had just flown. So finally, after a huge computer study, which is quoted in the book and is the subject of my dissertation uh, in more detail, there were three uh, or four answers. First of all, we'll buy the A-7, three wings. Two, we're going to put a gun on the F-4 to make the D model go to the E. And because we're going to have some uh, air-to-ground airplanes with the A-7, we need, a more, we need an air superiority fighter, and that was going to be the F-15, and that was the airplane the F-4 really wanted. So everything after that, for the next 10 years, was dominated by the Air Force priorities to get the F-15 operation. Uh, Secretary of Defense approved the Air Force by the A-7. He denied the gun in the F-4 and uh, delayed the development of the F-15. It took him another two years to get a gun in the F-4. That's the E model that I flew uh, later in, in the last part of my career. So we get two, two airplanes. Uh, the Navy A-7A, uh, A's and B's, uh, and E's, 535 aircraft. Lots of squadrons. I don't know how many, just dozens of squadrons. Uh, and the Air Force gets three wings at the Myrtle Beach, uh, and the A-7s that deployed to Karad from Myrtle Beach took over the Sandy mission of the A-1s in 1972, just before linebacker two. So, the, now, Vaught did not understand what had just happened, because he had a Navy project manager, an Air Force deputy, who was a one-star, actually he was a colonel at the time, he was a colonel, and then a Navy captain who was a Navy deputy. Well, the, these two guys, Bob Hales and Bob Doss, called the Bobsy Twins, got along together, and Bob Doss is a legend in the Navy. He had been in VX-6 at China Lake, he had an A4, he was the A4 squadron commander, his A4s, he demanded all the avionics be top notch. So doing the nuclear deliveries and everything, everything was right up to shape. A lot of A4 squadrons didn't put that much emphasis on the avionics. And so the Navy and A and B did not have advanced avionics. Well the big first problem was A and B were underpowered. The Navy didn't really think it had a problem because with the catapult launch, it's not such a big factor. Uh, even heavily loaded, although uh, they had uh, forgotten to test, or didn't test until later, the steam ingestion that the A's and B's had, which reduced the load they could take off. Turned out that they couldn't carry much more than the A4 uh, on the A and B version. So the first thing the Air Force wanted to do was to get a new engine in there, and Pratt Whitney was slow rolling the Navy on making a better engine, but they were selling TF-30s. Of course, TF-30 for the uh, F-11, TF-34, F-14, I think. Yeah, same TF-30. Uh, so we got a new engine. Uh, but again, the Air Force in 1954 had consolidated and replaced all of its multiple uh, uh, cannon with the rotary cannon. Hey, right, Jim, walk aboard. Here's an A-7 guy. Uh, Jim wanted to give some of your lectures on he flew the E model. And I'll get to the avionics uh, shortly. Uh, Jim gave me a lot of uh, tips uh, on the A-70. Uh, so the Air Force and Navy could not resolve the issue on the guns. Uh, they had two slide cannons or four slide cannons in the A-70s and Bs. But all the way to Secretary of Defense and McNamara directed the Navy to put the rotary cannon in the uh, A-70. And so they did. And with the change, Bob Ross told me, with the change in the fuselage that you needed to make with the new engine, 
the uh, rotary cannon, that was the time to make the avionics change. And so he and Bob Hales uh, got together, went around, and, and the, it, it's a marvelous story of, of politicking within a professional organization. Uh, and I've got a little model uh, that one of the professors developed. You get consensus among your colleagues at your level, your rank level, and when you, when you get that consolidated, then you start to go vertical. And you don't argue in terms of a new mission or a new strategy, that's too much for people to change. You're just improving something that has been tried and true mission in the service to date. So ground attack was still there, but the change from, uh, from, uh, uh, from analog to digital computers made all the difference in the world. It accounted for wind, and I'll show you the, uh, and it gave you this. It gave you a heads-up display, it heads out of the, out of the uh, instrument panel. Uh, the instruments, where there are 14 pieces of data that were displayed on the A7E uh, and D uh, windscreen, and the next variation of it goes into uh, the FA-18 and uh, the F-35. So this was 1968. Uh, this is uh, what, what's the 0.7 accuracy? Uh, bombing accuracy, like artillery accuracy, is the measure of unit is mills. A mill is one foot at a distance of a thousand feet. And the reason that that's useful is that it multiplies easily. If you're at 10,000 feet, when you release the bomb, at whatever is the dive angle you're at, a 10 mil accuracy is, will give you a 100 foot bomb. I mean, it's programmed to give you a 100, 100 foot bomb. The A7As and Bs and uh, I would say the F-4 was not as good, uh, not a good bomber, because it wasn't stable in uh, going so fast. Uh, the A-7, A-B probably had about 18 mil accuracy. And for some places in North Vietnam, that was enough, but for hitting a, a specific target and bridges, I mean, forget it. Uh, anybody knows about dive bombing bridges, uh, there's no way a conventional dive bomber was going to destroy a bridge. So, what they argued for, what, what the, uh, they went around the country talking to all the avionics manufacturers, and they came up to the study and said, how do give you 8 mils accuracy? Now, 8 mils rather than 18 mils is a huge, you know, uh, increase in, in accuracy. And so, all the debate about the avionics was how many mills would it put it in. And when they, uh, after they decided to put the uh, digital computers in the airplane, which gave him all the other information, uh, then the debate was how, what kind of mill accuracy is, is the manufacturer going to give you? And here there was a big, a big difference because the Navy had uh, LTV, had been used to giving the Navy their best product. We'll do as good as we can. They did not want to guarantee 10, 10 mils accuracy. And they maintained that the Air Force and Navy project managers insisted on them contracting for the, for the best accuracy that the study uh, had come out with. So we have a 10 mil system. Now, you can tell your uh, uh, visitors uh, the accuracy of the A7 has been unparalleled. Both Navy and Air Force nuggets have been able to bomb as good as professional guys with 18 years of service. And there's some quotes about from squadron commanders in that. And Air Force uh, uh, captain took out uh, six, no, four airplanes, six bombs each, and dispenser, 24 bullseyes. 24 bullseyes. Unheard of unheard of uh, before. And so uh, that was what the Air Force wanted. You're going to die on the... Uh, the <coughs> so 
the study came up with seven mil seven mil and part of that was due to the HUD. <coughs> and an unexpected benefit from the A7 pilots, uh, uh, one of the admirals told me, was you could put the uh, flight path marker on the lip of the carrier and it would give you uh, perfect uh, glide slope and attitude information made landing a lot easier, especially at night. So, good question. Thank you very much. Now, the Air Force never really liked the A-7. Uh, it was really forced on them uh, by uh, McNamara and the systems analysis guys. For example, the Air Force said, okay, we'll take three squadrons of uh, three wings of A-7s, and McNamara said, okay, you like that? Take five. Take five wings. So there was a blurb in the production schedule where the approval was for five wings. It never got to five wings. They ended up with three, but that was after McNamara left office. So that was the example of what happened. So the chief of staff, General McConnell, whom I interviewed when I was a major, never liked the A-7, and he wanted the Air Force is going to do uh, uh, dive bombing. It needs an airplane really built for close air support. Now, one of the lessons of World War One, I, I told you, was that ground attack airplanes are going to need armor. Who put armor in an airplane in the 1930s and 1940s? Only Ed Heinemann, the project manager for uh, A1 in 1950, uh, was a lieutenant commander who had uh, World War II experience, and he knew the benefit of armor plate uh, on, uh, on attack airplanes. And he saw a lot of losses in Korea due to ground fire. And he had uh, Douglas do a study, and they pointed out all the places in the airplane that were taking ground fire that uh, really debilitated the airplane. So he said, okay, we need armor plate. So he had a friend who was in the Office of Defense Production in the Korean War, and he said, I need tons and tons of armor plate. The guy said, well, let me work on it and see what we can get. Three weeks later, uh, he gets, the, the Navy commander, gets a phone call from a vice president at, uh, at Douglas and says, hey, I've got three boxcars out here of uh, steel. Of steel. He said, what should I do with them? And uh, the commander says, make armor plate. And when I flew in Vietnam, uh, the E model, we had half inch thick armor plate all the way from the engine back behind the cockpit, underneath the engine, underneath the, the fuel tank, and it was, a, it was a flying armored machine. And it only cut the airspeed by one knot. So it was a good trade off. Of course, uh, there's another story about how Ed Heinemann made the airplane so rugged, uh, and that's a, a, another innovation in the development process. So there are a lot of stories in the development process how we got these airplanes uh, that would be useful to you. So we wanted the A-10. Now, the fighter mafia. Did you know that the Navy had a fighter mafia also? It was guys in the 1970s who believed that the higher, faster, farther, F-14 and F-15 were not the way to go. You did not need twin engines, and you did not need to go Mach 2.4, because even the air fights don't occur that fast. 1.4 is about the way you need. And I had the F-4 at 1.4, and it turns like a puppy at, uh, at that airspeed. So, the, uh, they helped design, there were three guys, John Boyd, you'll see later, uh, was the head of the fighter mafia, and uh, they were going to overturn, of course, this was the late 60s, you know, the opposition to the war in Vietnam, there was a feeling in the country that everything we're doing, you know, in government is wrong. It's just bad, wrong, it's costing money, it's not effective. Uh, we were not doing well in Vietnam, of course, we weren't allowed to do well. Uh, but that was the problem. So they designed the A-10 around the gun. And there are a few, a few stories about the, the designer of the gun is a maverick and kind of a weird guy. 
that he was the developer. They're going to have separate development. Uh, and by the way, the A10O system project office started in the F15 project office at Wright Patterson. They got dovetailed in and, and then separated out later. So they finally produced the airplane. 1976, they're operational. The wing in England at Bentwaters flew 513 sorties in one day with 72 airplanes. That's about six, seven sorties a day, hot refueling, all going to the counter range, fully combat training uh, missions. Wonderful uh, airplane. Uh, Desert Storm, they killed 997 tanks and 726 artillery, and artillery is hard to kill. You know, you got to hit the tube, really, to uh, knock it out. And now, today, it's being phased out, but the, every A-10 pilot has memorized the phrase from General Horner. General Horner's son graduated from pilot training and went to become an A-10 pilot, and General Horner told people, said, my son has a brain injury. He's no longer a fighter pilot. He's flying A-10s. Well, about the fifth day into the war, when the A-10s were doing so well, General Horner's at the afternoon debriefing, and he's going around to each uh, element, and they're talking about what they did. And he says, OK, now we get to the A-10. He said, I take back all the bad things I said about the A-10. They're saving our ass. They love them. That is fantastic. And I say every, uh, every A-10 pilot can repeat that story. Yes. So what's, the, uh, what's taking its place? Is, is, is it as good as the A-10? No way. We're, we're facing it out. Uh, they're, they're down to one wing, and they're facing out a squadron at a time. And they're going to finish. Congress made them promise, made the Air Force promise to keep them until 2030. They're not going to make it until 2030. And the big argument is they're no use in a China war. Everything in the Pentagon now is focused on a war with China. And so the Navy's going crazy trying to figure out how to fight that. I don't know. Question. Well, we got to do is say, look what happened in Korea when we were fighting the Chinese. Yeah. Because there's a war that's taking place in the Chinese Navy. Yeah. Repeat the question, please. Well, he said, uh, if they have to remember the war in Korea, uh, close air support really kicked the butt of the Chinese. But I think they think that it, would, it wouldn't survive. Uh, the, the, the contest is going to be so complicated and so high technology that you're going to lose a lot of uh, lose a lot of our anyway, the word is they won't survive in the war. They're on the way up. Now, let's go back a little bit, and I hope I'm not getting too long. The fighter mafia really wanted to design a better airplane than the F-15. They didn't need two engines. They didn't need Mach 2.4 or 2.5. And the F-15 was going to be only for air superiority. It wouldn't have a two, it wouldn't have an air-to-ground roll. So, oh, and it was heavy, very heavy, 60,000 pounds. Remember they came right after the F-111, same engine? So the F-15 was originally designed with swing wing, even a swing wing, like the F-14. And you have all that heavy, uh, all that weight. Well, these two guys really got together. And this is the fighter, John Boyd. John Boyd was a fighter weapons school instructor he was known as 62nd Boyd because he would let guys get behind him and 60 seconds he would reverse and be on your table. He had two master's degrees, uh, went to Georgia Tech, uh, and he had an idea that we could do a 20,000 pound airplane called the Redbird, and uh, there were three miracles that happened that developed the F-16 and later the F-18. First of all, Mike Lowe, one of my classmates, was a major in the requirements office in the air staff, and the head of the office got a $149,000 uh, grant, and he said, 
We've led that out to, they put the RFP out to industry for $149,000, and they let industry bid on it. The industry sent their top engineers to, for conferences uh, at the Pentagon in a motel near the Pentagon at nights and weekends because they were deathly afraid that somebody would find out they were developing an alternative to the F-15 and they killed the program. So the first miracle was that it was such a small contract. Now, why would a manufacturing company send its best engineers to work on a uh, $90,000 contract? Because they know there's a billion dollar contract behind it for the winner of this competition. And so with Boop, you got a 50 50 chance. The result was, the second miracle was that the McNamara administration got voted out of office. Uh, Johnson came in and then Laird became Secretary of Defense. And Laird's deputy, Packard, from Hewlett Packard, set aside, uh, I think it was uh, $2 million for prototyping. Now, the Air Force was already a leap ahead. They had been designing this Redbird, this wonderful air-to-air -air airplane, uh, with a $149,000 contract, and so that was going to be their, one of their prototypes, and the cargo airplane for the C-17 was the second one. The Air Force won both of the prototype contests, and they had enough money to fund the F YF-16 and the YF-17. So the second miracle was Packard putting this money aside to have an internal competition of actually flying airplanes instead of designing them uh, only with computers. And so the fly-off competition was very close. Very, very close. The F-16 won. Uh, it was a little better in performing the air-to-ground role, uh, but they were both uh, good to fly. The uh, Cobra divided by Northrop uh, is a little different uh, and did not develop directly into the F-18, but I'll, uh, I'll get to that. So, and the Mike Lowe, the major, in the department shop, it, it had to come back to work the name, but he got a fellowship to go to MIT, and he wrote his master's thesis on fly-by-wire control systems for aircraft and was assigned right back in the requirement shop implementing the very thing he had written his master's thesis uh, about. Amazing. And so the F-16 was lighter because they saved the weight of all the hydraulics uh, in the airplane except for the landing gear. And the third miracle was he said, okay, now we've got the winner of the prototype competition. What are we going to do with it? At the same time, the uh, Air Force was bargaining with the Secretary of Defense to increase the number of Air Force wings. And so the Secretary of Defense said, if you buy the F-16, we'll give you six more wings of in the total fighter force structure. And at the same time, the uh, NATO chipped in and said, we need to replace all the F-104s that are in Europe, you know, standing nuclear alert and uh, they're getting old, and so we will chip in, and so if the United States buys the F-16, we will buy it for our NATO countries. They ended up, uh, I think, 39 countries brought the F-16. That's the third paragraph. Now, the F-16 back a little bit. The F-18 follows the F-16 by about three years, and in that three years, they interviewed a lot of A-7 pilots, Jim, uh, at uh, Northrop. Uh, the Navy was suspicious of Northrop because they had been an Air Force company. So they made them team with McDonnell Douglas, an old uh, Navy contractor. And in that three years, McDonnell Douglas called in the A-7 pilots and interviewed them and said, what do you need in terms of avionics? And so they took the A-7 avionics system, upgraded it, and in that three years, uh, they got a better avionics system than the F-16 had. 
And so uh, it's kind of ironic now that uh, Aaron Ayer, the guys, pilots have flown both, say they like the F-18 better because it's got an integrated cockpit. And for air to ground, they like the F-16 better. I don't know about the Agani, but they were both uh, improved. So, now at this point, the Navy had been flying uh, F-14s for air to air, even though they lived for bomb farm, and A-7 for air to surface, air to ground. And with the F-18, they were originally going to have an F-18A and an F-18B. so many knobs and dials on the throttles that they were able to combine the air to air and air ground features of the avionic system. And so the Navy, after 40 years of being having two separate cultures, now combine them uh, and F-18, F-A is both uh, air to air and air to ground. So it's no surprise that the Air Force long and now the Navy convinced of a multi-purpose airplane. Everybody is loving the F-35 if they can only get it into production and, you know. But there was a talk that the F-35 is so complicated that it's, it's slowed down the effort. And of course, the software changes have been uh, just numerous. And, uh, well, again, Operation 2015, it's hard to imagine, it's been operational for eight years. There's still not very many wings. I think the Marine Wing was the first one to be operational. The Air Force plans to buy 2,400. Israel's going to buy them. Australia's going to buy them. Uh, they're going to be the, uh, they're going to have a lot of F-35s. But Boeing never, who bought McDonnell Douglas after the disastrous A-12 problem, uh, Boeing was smart enough to say, you know, Navy, you're not getting very many F-35s originally. We'll be glad to produce some more F-18s for you to fill the gap. And so they've extended their production, I think, two or three times now. So the F-18s are still the main aircraft on deploying carriers. Well, that's about it. Uh, we've talked about two cultures. Uh, they began with specialized airplanes. Uh, both remain specialized for 40 years. 1960 is a big introduction of digital avionics that affected everything uh, up to the F-35. And with the exception of the A-10, uh, the Air Force has done multi-purpose, uh, overwhelmingly. And with the technology, now the Navy's multi-purpose, so diverging, diverging <coughs> we're now together in their training programs. Question? Yes, sir. Uh, it goes back to pre-World pre War II. Uh, uh, whether uh, Mitchell or what have pre-World War II Navy torpedo bomber versus dive bomber. Didn't the Navy realize the vulnerability of a torpedo bomber, obviously taking you right up to midway, and the, and the excessive losses of the torpedo bomber, and why they didn't make the adjustment earlier, if you will, to go to the go to the, the, the dive good, bomber? Good question. The question is, <coughs> when did the Navy uh, give up on having torpedo bombers only? The, uh, <clears throat> I think it's part of Navy culture. After World War I, the dominant Navy thought was that torpedoes would be the better weapon. Larger, heavier warhead, able to deliver it, you know, much more accurately than uh, dive bombers. But the problem was, of course, midway, the dive bomber, the torpedo bombers got blown away and did not make very much of an impact. But the change didn't occur in 1942, because in 1945, when Douglas built the AD, it was a dive torpedo bomber. The AD disguised the fact 
that the attack included both torpedo and, and tank bomb. But Korea, there was certainly no use for torpedoes, and uh, eventually the <clears throat> bomb carrying capability became dominant. Good question. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, I really enjoyed being here. Some books along. Uh, I would uh, recommend it. It's a great book for a volunteer for a ghost and guide. I'll be glad to endorse any of them uh, that you would like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.